go! My name is Finn Maxwell and this is my presentation on standing waves. Now, firstly, what is a standing wave? Initially, standing waves are longitudinal waves and they're not transverse waves. There are two types of waves, transverse and longitudinal waves. A transverse wave is made up of particles which move at a 90 degree angle to the direction of travel. For example, light is a transverse wave. Longitudinal waves are pressure waves, and so the particles are subject to rarefactions and compressions. Of course, sound is a longitudinal wave, and we know this because if we look at a loudspeaker playing sound, we can often see the speaker moving back and forth, which are the rarefactions and compressions of the wave. Standing waves occur between two resonation points. Example. In a typical room, there will be two parallel walls, and so a wave will reflect from one wall to the other, and it will go back on itself. And so it will not move from that position, hence why it's called a standing wave. Superposition of waves. For example, if you mix in a room where standing waves are untreated, it's likely that you'll be sitting right in the middle of the constructive or destructive interference of the wave, or as is formerly known, superposition of waves. In a nutshell, superposition of waves is artificial amplitude of a resultant wave. In this diagram, we can see the superposition patterns of both the constructive and destructive interference of waves. So, in the destructive interference wave, we can just we can see initially that these two waves are out of phase. So if we pretend that there's a straight line going from this point of the wave to here, we've got the plus points and the negative points of the waves, and this is called the peak amplitude. And superposition of waves is calculated by the adding the amplitude of the incident and the reflected wave, and that gives you the resultant wave. So as I said before, in this example, if you draw a straight line between here, you've got the plus point and the negative points, the peaks and the troughs of the wave. If, for example, we say that this is the incident wave, this is the reflected wave, if we just pretend that this is uh, this type of amplitude of 5 dB, uh, that's plus 5 dB, that's obviously going to be minus 5 dB, and it's going to be the same for the reflected wave. However, since these are out of phase, this is going to be, be minus 5 dB, and that's going to be positive. So when you add the amplitudes together, you get an amplitude of 0 dB. For constructive interference, it's of course the opposite. So as you can see, both these waves are in phase. Um, if we take the peak amplitude to be 5 dB, it's going to be 5 dB at 5 dB, which gives the resultant wave an amplitude of 10 dB. Now I'm going to talk about how to calculate the problem frequencies within your room. Calcul cancellations due to standing waves can cause overcompensation when we're mixing. Uh, in this example, well, in a critical listening environment, superposition is actually damaging to our perception of our mixes. If we mix in a room that has dimensions, of six meters in length, two meters in height for one of the walls, and of course the same height but a different length for the shorter wall. Um, the standing waves that are likely to be the problem will reflect between the two parallel walls. And with standing waves, the worst ones to have are the ones that fit perfectly into the two parallel walls, and I'm going to calculate what these frequencies are going to be. So, if we have the initial formula, which is, well, to calculate wavelength or wave speed, it's V equals F lambda, or frequency times wavelength. V is the speed of sound, which is 340 beats per second. Obviously, the wavelength is going to be the one which fits perfectly in between the two walls. 
So this is going to be six meters on the first wall and four meters on the shorter wall. To solve the formula for the frequency, we have to find the speed of sound by the length of the wing or the wall. And this will give you resulting frequencies of 57.6 hertz for the long wall and 87 hertz for the shorter wall. Now, of course, these aren't going to be the only frequencies. Um, they're going to be multiplied by per octave. So this is going to be we have a lower octave, it's going to be a low note. But because of the way standing waves work, it's these dips or cancellations are going to occur um, at every single octave. So you have to double the frequencies per octave. Obviously, we don't want standing waves in our mixing environment, so we have to deal with them. And the first thing we can do is to mix in a more appropriate room design. Most critical listening environments are designed to contain no parallel walls. For example, Studio One has a slightly tilted ceiling, so the reflected wave will not line up to the incident wave and thus cause cancellations. The second way is to use acoustic treatment. Using acoustic treatments such as bass straps and diffusers are useful for absorbing resonant frequencies, uh, eliminating the chance for waves to travel back in themselves and cancel or sum. And in this picture we can see it's a fairly small home studio or control room. It has acoustic treatments on the ceilings, on the back walls, to stop reflections, etc. Now I move on to anechoic chambers and reverberation rooms. Anechoic chambers are designed to have zero reverb time and they're also known as dead rooms. These kinds of environments are created by having a very large amount of acoustic treatment. Most treatment is generally used in order to re reduce reverb times at problematic frequencies, but anechoic chambers have been designed to eliminate reverb entirely and then the room can be used to test various technology like microphones, amplifiers, and speaker systems. Reverberation rooms are, of course, the opposite to anechoic chambers. These are designed in order to create a highly diffused acoustical measuring environment. And these rooms can be used to measure properties of sound absorbing materials, such as acoustic treating foam. Here's an example of an anechoic chamber. As you can see, there's a lot of acoustic treatment on the walls. These are designed, well, they're cut out of a point, so this stops reflections. Um, this is a picture of a rever reverberation room. The walls, well, every single surface in the room is made of concrete, which is the highest reflecting surface. And there are panes of glass hanging from ceilings, and all across the room, just to cause maximum reflection. Standing waves and musical instruments. Standing waves are not always problematic. They are often the foundation for musical instruments, such as a pipe organ, which generates tone via standing waves. Here we have a diagram of a standing wave in a pipe with one open end and one closed end. Uh, um, as we can see from the dark. As we can see from the diagram, the length of the pipe is only covering a quarter of the wavelength because it's just it's a quarter of that is cutting into the length. So to calculate the to calculate the wavelength, we have to times four um, times the length by four. So. For example. If we say that the wavelength in this pipe is 0 0.5 meters, uh, 0 0.5 meters, we can work out the length of the pipe by doing, calculating 
0.25, which is of course a quarter of the decimal, times the wavelength, which is 0 0.5, which will give a length of one, 0.125 meters. Using the wavelength, we are also able to calculate the note that's actually being played in that pipe at that, at that wavelength. Okay, so to do this, we have to use the uh, the V equals F lambda formula. This is also being rearranged to solve for the frequency. So for this, we divide the speed of sound by the wavelength, which is 340 divided by 0 0.5 meters. And this will give a frequency of 680 hertz, which is the note of F, but it's actually slightly flat according to my trusty uh, frequency note diagram. Sounding waves on strings. String instruments also function as sounding waves, but the main difference between pipes and strings is that string instruments rely on tension to sound. Okay. This is a diagram of a standing wave represented on a stringed instrument. <coughs> Obviously, just by looking at it, we can see that the length of the string is actually only is half of the wavelength to do so to get the length of the string, we have to times the wavelength by two. So if we pretend, for instance, that this is actually a guitar string, the two resonation points between the standing waves here and here represent a represent the nut of the guitar and also the bridge of the guitar, and this one actually also represents your finger. If we take this diagram to represent my own guitar at home, I know that the length of the string is going to be 0 0.6 meters, therefore the wavelength is going to be twice that, which is 1.2 meters. Uh, when we tighten the string using the machine heads on the guitar or any string instrument, the frequency changes whilst the wavelength remains constant. And this is because the frequency and tension are directly proportional. So as one increases, so does the other. For every one octave increase, a note with an open string, the tension is then times by four. Okay. So if we assume that the guitar is tuned to standard E tuning, the lowest note is obviously going to be E, so its corresponding frequency is going to be 164.8 hertz, according to my frequency chart. And if we assume that the string, the string gauge or string diameter is 0 0.056 of an inch, the guitar string company um, says that the tension is 28 pounds, which in newtons is 125. So when we complete the formula, for this, we've obviously got the initial fundamental frequency of 164.8 hertz and the initial tension of 125 newtons. So when we complete it, we have the resulting frequency, still noted E, 329.6 hertz, and the tension has become 500 newtons. And this is the end of my presentation. If you've got any questions about my presentation, now is the time. No? Alright.